Today's headline is George Westinghouse. The subheadline says, a 100,000 horsepower man. It says, a big man with a 100,000 horsepower inside him. A masterful man with 25,000 men directly under his leadership. A man who controls whatever he touches. An absolute ruler, as absolute as the czar. George Westinghouse is a trained engineer, an inventor, a manufacturer, and a financier. The combination is unique. Other men have won high places in commerce and industry, have been and are great forces. But they have not worked in a single-handed fashion. They have had strong partners. They have surrounded themselves with men of money. But this man has no partners, and you do not hear his name associated with groups of assistant multimillionaires. He stands apart like a tower that draws all attention to itself by its altitude, its proportions, and position. All his interests, it is true, are in company form, incorporated. But he controls the companies and his word is the law that governs their energies. These organizations afford the most conspicuous example of one-man power in the industrial world today. They are not American enterprises only. They are international. There are nine manufacturing companies of his in the United States, one in Canada, and five in Europe, two of the latter being in England, one in France, one in Germany, and one in Russia. In New York, there's also a great company of contracting engineers. In Pittsburgh, there's a financial company, and in London, another. The manufacturing companies divide the world between them as a market for their output. In every considerable city, you will find their offices or their agents. This business system is imperial in plan and operation. It is a world-encircling empire with an absolute monarch at its head. Stevenson taught us how to move a railway train. Westinghouse taught us how to control its movements and he made modern railway traffic possible. We cannot travel at the speed we do, nor operate the long and heavy trains without being able to regulate their movements perfectly and instantly. The Westinghouse break is the device by which the end is gained. Wherever there are railways, you will find this break. His activity lasting. The invention has been known for so long a time that one encounters many persons who think it must have been invented by this man's father. But the inventor was none other than the renowned Pittsburgher who is today at the height of his activities 58 or 59 years young. He was in his early 20s when the brake was first applied to a train and he had been experimenting for months at least before he hit upon the idea of using compressed air. There is no truth in the story which has been going about the world ever since in every language and which is still turned up every week by the press clipping men that Commodore Vanderbilt summarily concluded an interview which the young inventor had sought, declaring that he hadn't time to listen to the damn fool idea of trying to stop a train with air. The story is good enough to be true, but I have heard Mr. Westinghouse say that it is sheer invention. On the first run of the first train to which the air brake was applied, an accident was prevented and lives were saved. Young Westinghouse, having a better business head and more nerve than inventors usually are said to possess, declined to sell his patents. He formed a company, had the majority of shares allotted to himself, and then strode on to fortune. That's the mint, I once heard him say to a visitor, who seeing in the distance the big manufactory of the brake company, asked what it might be. Having shown the world how to stop a train, he next undertook to show when to stop it. He invented signaling systems and formed a company to manufacture them. Applying electricity to signaling work, he was led further afield. Electricity fascinated his imagination. He began to experiment with it in other directions and fitted up a laboratory for research work. In 1885 or 1886, he organized the Westinghouse Electric Company, which has outgrown all his other undertakings. In Europe, experiments with the alternating current were attracting expert attention. He purchased the patent rights for America. He brought Tesla to Pittsburgh and backed him in his researches. The induction motor was a result. He bought Tesla's patents and immediately began to develop alternating current machines for commercial purposes. Everybody said he was reckless. That didn't matter. Then they tried to stop him. He increased his efforts. Experts, competitors, scientific men, at home and abroad, prophesied failure. As he didn't fail, they filled the air with cries of public danger. Prohibitive legislation was invoked in a dozen states, or were they 22, on the ground that by the use of the alternating current, 
the risk to human life and to property would be so great that the system should be forbidden by law. But Westinghouse went on and succeeded. The opposition sputtered and died. And for years past, the great developments in electrical work have been for the alternating current system. Boundless versatility. He organized an engine building company, built steam engines, gas engines, and was the first man in the United States to undertake seriously the development of the steam turbine. He acquired the Parsons Turbine Pants for America. He organized an incandescent lamp company, the Nerds Lamp Company, and a company for manufacturing the Cooper Hewitt Lamp. He will organize a company without more ado than another man will make over eating his breakfast. I have known him at the breakfast table, buy a copper mine, send a man to Europe to investigate a newly announced electrical discovery, and give instructions for a series of experiments to be made in some entirely new direction. A big man with 100,000 horsepower inside him. He is more physical endurance than any 10 of the 25,000 men in his employ. He is always working, except when he sleeps, and he is a good sleeper. When one thing is accomplished, another is begun. The successes do not chain his interest. Achievement attracts him, so he is ever doing some new thing, and thus his undertakings multiply. Once, when he sold a property at a price that would have been a snug fortune for another man, I heard him say, this will give me a little ready cash to conduct such and such experiments. He probably has expended a quarter of a million on these experiments, and one of these days, a new industry will spring from them. A typical Pittsburgh day with him is of this order. Breakfast comes at 7.30, and almost invariably, there is someone staying in the house with whom he can talk business. Otherwise, there is always a telephone. After breakfast, there is a railway journey of several miles to the Westinghouse Works. He takes them in the order of their accessibility, first the machine company where the engines come from. This concern began with steam engines, then it added gas engines to his output after years of experiment, and now it adds to these, two lines of the steam turbine, also after years of test. He walks through the shops, watches the progress on special work, watches tests, sees how things generally are running. He interviews the management, makes suggestions, asks questions, searching ones, calls for blueprints, ascertains the money value of orders and deliveries, and before you, if you are a layman, can take a breath. He is out of this place and into another, the gigantic works of the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company. This place is too vast for even his exhaustless energy to traverse physically every day. Mentally, he surveys it at all hours. But the buildings are so huge. Experts say they are the largest machine shops in the world. Their two-story floor space so vast, and the variety of operations and of things produced so numerous that he must confine his visit to a specific section for a specific purpose, or there would be no end to his journey. As it is, you marvel how, out of this infinite variety, proper parts arrive at a stated time at a certain place, where they are put together and form a new machine, a Niagara generator, a pair of motors for an electric car, a mighty machine for driving the trains in the New York subway. Orders a special train. There is a Westinghouse railroad, several miles long, connecting the several works, carrying castings and supplies, delivering the mechanisms that are made, and giving opportunity for experiments with cars and trains and systems of electric distribution. Mr. Westinghouse orders a train and supervises a test of his latest device for simultaneously operating and controlling all the motors on the train, or he orders out the car on which are fitted the new single-phase alternating current motors, which it is said are going to change the practice on all electric roads. He consults with his manager of works, his chief electrician, chief engineer, the head of the commercial end of the organization, and any number of others, and then he goes to the brake works, where also there are tests of new devices. After luncheon, he will visit the Westinghouse Foundry, his newest establishment at Trafford City, a little town just building up beyond Pittsburgh and named with a certain deference to Trafford Park in Manchester, England, where the British Westinghouse works were built two or three years ago. Then he goes back by railroad to town, 15 miles or more to his own office. In the evening, there will be a dinner party. Perhaps some distinguished scientist is present, or visiting engineer, or railroad president, or European ambassador. If there be none of these, it is a business dinner of half a dozen, or maybe a dozen and a half of his principal men, and the things that could not be talked about during the day are discussed closely. 
After three or four days like this in Pittsburgh, his private car is connected to a Pennsylvania Express train, and eastward he goes. If it's Friday night in winter, he goes to Washington and passes Saturday and Sunday at his home there. If it's spring or summer or autumn, his destination is his country home at Lenox in the Berkshire Hills. On Monday, his car takes him to New York, and there his work is chiefly financial, and his office at 120 Broadway the center of negotiation. Here this industrial sovereign sits on his American throne. When he goes abroad, he issues his decrees from the Westinghouse building in London, and he goes abroad twice a year. This big-bodied, big-brained man, with a hundred thousand horsepower inside him, has the double blessing of superb health and a sanguine temperament. He is the most hopeful of optimists. As soon as he evolves an idea, it seems almost to rank in his mind with the accomplished facts, mechanical and financial. Difficulties are merely things to overcome. Obstacles, and they are many, are simply to be overborne or shattered. They do not keep him awake at night. He is the personification of force, and the man who opposes his will must wear a bridge. He is one of the men who make two blades of grass grow where one or none has grown before. It is playing the game that interests him. He is not one of the millionaires who keep yachts, racing stables, automobiles, and picture galleries. He does not gamble. He does not smoke and he never plays second fiddle in any orchestra. He always conducts. What he cannot control, he will not touch. Amalgamations, consolidations, are not for him, unless he is to be ruler of them. He takes quick likings and strong dislikes, and his ambition is to extend his great industries to many countries, to build them up there so that they become, as it were, national institutions, and to have their products in every sea and in every land. Check back soon for part two of this incredible story. This story came from the great state of New York, being reported in the New York Times of March 6th, 1904. Thank you for joining us today. If you want to continue to uncover all of America's lost and forgotten history, then remember before you leave to hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, and remember to like and comment below. And we will see you next time on Americana Archives.